if you, uh, if you have something you'd like to ask, keep it in mind for following our keynote address, which comes from Dr. Jeffrey Mitchell, who is a clinical professor of emergency health services at the University of Maryland in Baltimore County, President Emeritus of the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation. He's taught elementary school science for three years, moved on though, obviously, to his PhD in human development from University of Maryland. He served as a firefighter, <coughs> excuse me, and a paramedic and developed a comprehensive and systematic integrated and multi-component crisis intervention program called Critical Incident Stress Management, which we have all heard of. He's authored more than 250 articles, 10 books in the stress and crisis intervention fields, now serves as an adjunct faculty member of the Emergency Management Institute for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. He's a reviewer for the Journal of the American Medical Association, Psychological Reports, Perceptual and Motor Skills, and the International Journal of Emergency Mental Health. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Jeffrey Mitchell. That's right. I have to tell you my Canadian story on um, Katrina. So our guys are down there. Um, they're working in various parts. There are a lot of places that were very difficult to access. And a Canadian crew comes in from Vancouver, and they're doing urban search and rescue operations. And uh, the people got to like them a lot, and they were really helping out and everything. And um, after about five days, the Federal Emergency Management Agency shows up in, in this area. And the people were not very receptive to them. And they said, where were you for the last five days? The Canadians were here. <laughs> so. We're going to look at the psychology of disaster and surviving the emotional effects. And there certainly are many emotional effects. And they range from the victims of the event all the way through to the people who provide the rescue services and uh, also to people who are involved in cleanup afterwards. And it might surprise you that the United States Weather Service uh, has a team that goes in and investigates these events, these meteorological events. And uh, when they go in, they often have to deal with very distressed people as they're looking in these neighborhoods. Uh, and they have had to seek help from our critical incident stress teams on more than one occasion. So uh, you got to be thinking of the big perspective. It's not just uh, the people who are primary uh, survivors, it's the whole gamut. And then we have folks, even in Red Cross, who have come out of these experiences and it has been a life changer for them. And some of them have a really tough time recovering from the emotions and it goes on for years thereafter, not just a very short period of time. Um, so when we're looking at these effects, um, one of the things I would like to start with is that there are some effects that happened uh, decades ago, sometimes centuries ago. Um, for instance, in um, Wexford, Ireland, uh, when Cromwell was conquering Ireland, um, he uh, came to the town of Wexford. They had put up resistance there in Wexford, and uh, they slaughtered 2,500 Irishmen in one single day in Wexford. And uh, Cromwell said about Wexford, I thought it not right or good to restrain off the soldiers from their right of pillage or from doing execution upon the enemy. Uh, it was a devastating blow to Wexford. And let me tell you, there's a thing called transgenerational transmission of trauma. And that story, and you know, many stories around it, was passed down um, through the generations. And my mother came from Wexford. And I was a little boy growing up and heard stories of the slaughter in Wexford. So it passes from generation to generation. And uh, you know, as a little boy, I thought, wow, that was really unfair. I mean, I didn't know much about the politics of the whole thing, but it just didn't seem right to me that they would be able to do that. So that stuff lasts. The um, experience with uh, the slaughter in Wexford uh, and the conquering of Ireland led to uh, the Great Famine in the 1840s. And that led to the huge migration of Irishmen to North America. And that led to a position where to become a citizen in the United States, it was easier if you did that by joining military service. And uh, they did that to the tune of over 500,000 Irishmen joined the American Civil War. And uh, there were many of them that spoke Gaelic. And they were in all Irish brigades. So uh, one thing cascades into another. If you look at history, one set up 
sets up the next thing all the way down the line. And um, here we have a hint of some of the uh, acute uh, psychological reactions uh, during the battle. This is uh, from, the, uh, from Gettysburg in 1863. And the shells from our batteries had told with fearful and terrible effect upon them. And the dead in some places were piled upon each other. And the groans and the moans of the wounded were truly saddening to hear. In the American Civil War, we identified a condition called soldier's heart. We now know of that as post-traumatic stress disorder. Except in the American Civil War, we were pretty good at identifying. We weren't very good at treating, OK? Uh, so that came much later. And um, it was, in fact, the, um, and this is just another scene. And, and listen to the words, OK? Uh, this is from a Confederate uh, lieutenant in the Confederate States of America in South Carolina. Uh, he said, these scenes of God have swept over my soul in successive swoons of horror and blood. And you can hear there the elements of what we now know of as post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and it was the French who figured out that there were some simple things that can be done that would make a very big difference for uh, the soldiers. And simple things was reduce the stimuli of war. Take them off the front lines just a little bit, enough to cut down. In fact, um, they often called it within earshot of cannon fire. Okay? And they found that if they took them too far back, they had a hard time getting them recovered and putting them up on the front lines. If they took them back just a little bit and then did some very simple things, and the simple things were rest, food, removal of war stimuli, uh, giving people the opportunity to talk about their experience, and uh, they found that they were able to get uh, about 60% of their troops back into combat by treating them early. So early intervention makes sense. Um, and then uh, in, um, in their experience, they kind of kept those things. They let people know that. The next thing that came around was Edward Sterling, who was the first mental health professional to study the psychosocial aspects of disaster. And he looked at the Courier mining disaster. This is a large mine uh, in northern France, not too far from the French border. And um, they had a methane gas explosion there. And as a result of that, um, 1,100 miners were killed. It, it remains today one of the world's greatest mining disasters of all. It's up and around the top five of all the greatest mining disasters. 1,100 miners were killed, most were children. There was no such thing in those days as child protective laws. And why did they use children? Because they're small, and they could fit into coal veins, and they'd use a miniature pickaxe, and they'd take the coal and push it behind them, use their feet to push it out, and then it would be put in these coal carts and taken to the surface. They had a methane gas explosion, 1,100 of miners were killed, it was a devastating psychosocial impact, had impact on the farmers who sent their kids into the mines, had impact on the entire fabric of the community. Some of those farms, farmers lost their only children in the experience. So it was a horrible, horrible psychosocial impact. And um, there were some efforts made by Edward Sterling to actually do some basic crisis intervention, um, which the French had picked up in the 1870s. Next thing that came along was um, Eric Lindemann. Eric Lindemann worked in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. He ran a clinic, it was actually called a crisis intervention clinic. And um, uh, Eric Lindemann uh, was called to the scene of the uh, terrible Coconut Grove fire. Uh, that was a fire that was in a social club, uh, Coconut Grove, in Boston, Massachusetts. And um, that fire was something that left a lasting impression on many, many people uh, from that era. Uh, in the uh, Coconut Grove fire, they actually lost um, 492 people. Uh, there were many things that got changed after that. For instance, we now have these panic bars on doors, and doors and commercial structures open outward. That was a direct result of the Coconut Grove fire. But the, the other direct results was that um, Eric Lindemann took the opportunity to study the victims, the survivors, and to see how they were reacting to this. So it's a very a benchmark study for all of us. Um, and I had a 
really incredible experience. On the anniversary date, at the 50-year anniversary, I had taught a four-day class in Asheville, North Carolina. And um, when I teach a four-day class, I'm done. I want to go home. I don't want to talk to any human being on the face of the planet. I just want to go home. I've talked for four days, so I don't need to talk anymore. And I get to the airport in Asheville, and the smiling ticket agent behind the counter says, well, sir, that flight's a little delayed. And I say, and what is the translation of a little delayed? And she said, oh, about three hours, sir. When people smile and they're giving you bad news, it makes you want to hurt them, okay? <laughs> so I slink down to my gate, totally discouraged, because all I want to do is go home. And I figured, okay, I'll read my book. I'll just have to adjust and make do. And I'm there 10 minutes, and an elderly gentleman walks in, looks around, there's 49 chairs left. He makes a beeline directly to me, and he comes over and he says, so, what do you do? I figured, okay, easiest way to get rid of somebody is tell them what I do. I said, I'm a disaster psychologist. I specialize in gloom, doom, pain, gore, blood and guts, baby deaths, things like that. Most people who are normal step back. And they know, this is not a conversation I want to continue. But he said, well, I was in a disaster once. And I said, you were? And a hook was being planted. And he said, yeah, I'm sure you wouldn't remember it. He said, but today is the anniversary. And I said, Coconut Grove, Boston, Massachusetts, 1942. He said, how did you know that? I said, I specialize in gloom and doom and pain and gore and blood and guts. OK? That's how he knew that. And then he said, I was there. It was horrible. It was terrible. And he tells the story. And he got into that story. And he cried. And I said, listen, sir, uh, this might be something you might not want to talk about, man. Oh, no, I want to tell you this story. You specialize in gloom and doom, pain and gore, blood and guts. Here it is. OK? <laughs> and he tells the story. And it was intense, very, very intense. And the story went on for over three hours. And he told the entire story beginning to end. He saw the fire start, okay? He saw the busboy hold the cigarette lighter up there to try to get the bulb changed in one of those recessed lights, which were stored in plywood boxes at the time, okay? And now, what happens is the decorations catch on on the ceiling and it starts dropping fire all over the place. And he had a date with him and he knew my mission is to get this girl out of here. And he grabbed her by the hand. He had six friends sitting at a round table with him and eight people at the table. He said, follow me, this is really bad and we've got to get out of here and I'm going to the exit. He grabbed the girl by the hand and ran and everybody else hesitated thinking it was part of the show. And they even had said that to him. He got outside. And you have to ask yourself, in 1942, when we were gearing up for the Great Invasion, and we were coming out of the Great Depression, what was the best clothing you could wear if you'd taken a date out that night? Military uniform. And what happened is the police came and the fire personnel came over and they said, guys in uniform, we need your help. We got a lot of people in there, we got to pull out. They put the fire out, then these guys removed the victims. And they put them on a sidewalk, and when they ran out of room, they, they stacked them like cordwood. And he tells the story, and uh, it was so intense, it was amazing to me how fast three hours can pass. When he finished, his flight was being called, he stood up, I stood up to shake his hand. He put his arms around me and he said, I wish I had met you after that event. I said, sir, I wasn't even born then. And he said, had I had somebody to talk to, if I could have told my story, I would not have lived for 50 years with nightmares every night. And I will tell you that the ghosts of the past do not fade away entirely. They are always there waiting for a moment to come out and remind us of the tragedies we've experienced in the past. Now, 
Psychological casualties during World War II, overall, 10% of soldiers taken out of operations were taken out because, not because they had holes in their bodies, but because they could not fight anymore. Look, Ma, no holes, just can't fight no more. On D-Day, that rate was doubled to 20%. Have you ever want to know why? Rent Saving Private Ryan, watch the first 20 minutes and you will have a really good idea why it was doubled up on the, on the D-Day. And in the last months of the war, it actually reduced. We say, well, why? Did warfare get easier? Oh, no, in September 1944, we had crossed the Rhine. And they were fighting for the fatherland. And they were fighting vicious. And Hitler declared total war, wounded, Women, children, old people, go to the front, fight the invaders, okay? It did not get easier. On the Pacific side, we were invading Okinawa. We were in their turf, and they did the same kind of thing. Fight them in every way, and warfare got worse. But why did the numbers drop? Because we got better at identifying and intervening. We got better at providing those simple things, rest, food, okay, fluids somebody to talk to. That's what made the difference. That's what reduced it. What you're looking at there is the thousand mile stair. When you see that today at a disaster site, you're dealing with a very stressed person. Let me tell you about the Brooklyn Marine Terminal. Brooklyn Marine Terminal was a few blocks from the apartment that I lived in in Brooklyn, New York. That picture is taken from Sunset Park, a place where I went sled riding when I was a kid, a place where I played softball, a place where I went swimming in the big pool they had there, the big community pool. And that's Bush, Guard, uh, Bush Terminal. You see all of that in the background, those white buildings. That was the largest shipping center for war materials in the Second World War. It went from 26th Street all the way up to 39th Street. That's a huge area. Anything that's about 20 blocks in New York City, is a mile, and it was all waterfront property. They had at that facility the largest dock that was out into the water of any place on the planet at the time. It was 1,475 feet, you could actually dock three ships end to end and still have plenty of room left over. And on December 3rd, 1956, I came out of St. Michael's Elementary School on 4th Avenue and 42nd Street, I had to walk, yeah, you know, it was really tough as a child, you know, I had to walk home, or walk to school, oh yeah, it was tough, but you know, it was only like three blocks. So I had to walk to 40th Street and 5th Avenue, we are really talking three blocks, right? I get to 41st Street, 4th Avenue, I am looking up at a column of smoke filling the skies of Brooklyn, and it was a huge, huge fire, and it was down at the Bush Terminal, and on 41st Street, Three kids came rolling down a hill on their bikes, and they saw me and they stopped. They were in the opposite class. If I was in, uh, whatever, 4A, they were in 4B, whatever. And they came down and they saw me and they said, come on, we're going to the fire. And I thought, oh, gee, if I go to the fire, the penalty from my mother will be worse than death. So I better not go to the fire. So I said, I just can't do that. And I got called every name in the book. And those three took off on their bikes. And I went home and my brother Don and I, we opened up the big window in the living room and we were looking out and seeing the fire. You could actually see the flames rolling into the sky. Um, the column of smoke is about a thousand feet high, right? And all of a sudden there was something that flew up in the sky and then the blast wave hit. And when that blast wave hit, my brother and I were bowled across the living room floor I mean, we were entangled with each other, trying to, you know, look like a bag of knees and elbows. Now, people wanted to know how I became a disaster psychologist. When that happened, my mother comes running into the room. She sleeps during the day because she works at night. And this happened, and she runs in and she says, What did you do? <laughs> That's how I became a disaster psychologist, my, my mother's fault. I was doing fine before that, okay? Wow. Didn't expect that, okay? Well, in that tragedy, um, there were some pretty and terrible things that happened there. 
I was worried about my uncle. He was a firefighter on one of the engine companies there. Probably would have been second due uh, on this fire. I mean, I remember many times him right along Fourth Avenue, and I'd be walking home, and he'd be waving at me. So I was worried about him. And uh, there was a fireboat there where all the crew got blown off the deck of the fireboat. Had to be picked up by a Coast Guard cutter and brought back to shore. And they got back on shore, and they went over and they picked up the landlines. Can't attack it from the sea, we'll take it by land. All right? Now, what about those three guys who came down the hill, rolled over there in our bicycles? All three were killed. Two of them were beheaded by the force of the explosion, and one died of the internal injury caused by the shock wave going through his body. Other than my grandmother's funeral, who died in the same year, that was the first funeral I had ever gone to. Couldn't quite understand why the two caskets were closed, and one was open. Didn't quite understand that. Okay, now, that left a very lasting impression on me, and as a teenager, I spent a lot of time reading books on trauma and disaster and crisis, okay? And to this day, some of my uh, favorite reading, it's not, it's not fun reading, but it's my favorite reading, happens to be in the areas of warfare, disaster, crisis, okay? Still doing that today. Uh, so it's been a, a lifelong experience with me in that particular event. Now, one of the things, let me back that up. One of the things that you can say, the Franco-Prussian War, Courier Mining Disaster, World War I, Coconut Grove, World War II, and the Brooklyn Marine Disaster, you know what they share in common? They share in common that all of them use those very simple things to try to make a difference for people during the crisis. One is reduce the stimuli and protect people. Provide protection from who? Often from the media, often from what we call in the States, looky-loos, where people just go to stare at it. They don't offer anything to it. Um, care for basic needs, food, fluid, shelter. It's the kind of stuff that the Red Cross does. That's what we do, right? It, it was amazing to watch in Hurricane Katrina. They had 18,000 Red Cross workers down there, okay? About 2,000 were Canadians. And to watch people from north of the border come down there and just spend their time Volunteering to help is a very impressive thing. You want to regroup people with family and friends. And if they're emergency teams, you want them to get them back in their typical units that they normally work with. You want to provide information and guidance. Information is one of the most powerful things we have. It reduces anxiety fairly quickly. It works better than a whole category of drugs called anxiolytics. Okay? Information, let's try that for a change. And what you want to have is a positive outcome expectancy. If I go to half of the audience out here and I say, folks, you've been through a terrible thing, and I'm sorry you went through that. Our experience is most people recover. We're going to help you with that. We can't do it all in one day, but stick with us. We'll get you through this, OK? So most people recover. We'll be back. Hang tight. I go to this group over here, and I say, what you all been through? Worst possible thing that could ever happen in your lives, people been through what you've been through, they are never the same again. Good luck. <laughs> Who do you think has a better chance of getting better? I'm going to tell you it's a positive expectancy group. That's the ones that's going to get better. Crisis is defined as an acute emotional response to a critical incident. You didn't have the critical incident, the, the event, the stimuli, you want to have the reaction. Hey, here's the deal, folks. If we don't have to have the critical incident, and we then ha don't have to have the reaction, we don't have to do crisis intervention. So here's the deal. Stop all bad things from happening, and then you won't need crisis intervention. It's like me. There you go. OK? Simple solution, right? Yeah, that'll work, Wilbur. Yeah, I'm sure. That'll fly. All right? Now, psychological crisis is identified by Gerald Kaplan in 1964. He wrote a book called Preventative Psychiatry. And he identifies three common characteristics of all crises. Number one is the homeostasis, a very scary word. It means balance, OK? The balance between thinking and feeling gets disrupted in the crisis. And therefore, you have increased stress. One's usual coping mechanisms that always worked in the past, they just ain't working now, OK? And there's evidence of significant distress, impairment, and, and dysfunction. 
That's from Gerald Kaplan, 1964. And listen, just because it's old doesn't mean it's no good. All right, 64, do the math. How many years have passed since then? And we're still using those tactics today, understanding what a crisis is, okay? Now, um, whoops, getting a little crazy on me. There we go. Um, now, stages of crisis, it's all the stuff that builds up to the crisis, okay? You have a little tiny star up there where that first line is, and that's the initiation of the crisis. Something happens. And when that thing happens, you see the dotted line? Okay, the dotted line says, we try to keep doing that which we were doing before. It's called denial. Now, emergency personnel are frequent flyers on denial airlines. Okay, they get a lot of points stored up for that. And they always deny. I'm okay, doesn't bother me. I'm good, I'm good, all right? And they think they're not being impacted by this stuff. And I gotta tell you, having been a firefighter and a paramedic, I have that same personality. I'm good, I'm good, everything's fine, 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 okay? Yeah. September 22nd, 1999. I'm teaching a group of Baltimore County paramedics. I got people who are taking notes. They're laughing at my jokes. It's one of these wonderful days in an instructor's life. Wow, if only my college students acted like that, okay? My pager goes off, and it was the time when you carried the alphabet numeric pager, and it had my home phone number with space 911. Space 911, space 911, space 911. That means I should have called yesterday, all right? You give me 911, I give you a fairly quick call back, like now. That meant this is really bad. And when I called home, my wife hears my voice and burst into tears. And I say, is it Kyla? Is it Kyla, who was five months at the time? And my wife says, no, it's not Kyla. Kyla is fine. I said, then is it you? Are you OK? And she said, I'm fine. Kyla's fine. It's not us. I said, and what's going on? She said, this is about your brother. So which brother? Because there's five boys, two girls in the family. She said, Michael. I said, what happened with Michael? Michael was involved in an auto accident last night around midnight. How bad is Michael? Pause. And she said, this is really hard for me to tell you. And I said, okay, how bad is Michael? She said, it was a fatality accident. And I say, how bad is Michael? Here, denial. No? Hey, I'm a frequent flyer too. How bad is Michael? And then she says, Michael was a fatality. Whew. Didn't expect that train. And that took me out of service there. And then I had the stomach turning and the knees knocking together and all that stuff. And then I hear her say, and there's something that makes this worse. Hello. You have to work really hard to make that worse. And I said, what would that be? And she said his wife, Patty, was killed in the same accident. Yeah, by degrees, that made that somewhat worse, all right? Now, I go back to that classroom, and the coordinator pops up, looks at my face, and he says, oh my God. And I say, I'm going to have to shorten this class. There will be no break, and we'll be ending early. And then I attempt to go back in there and teach the rest of the class. Should I have been in there? No way. I'm not in the shape to be teaching the rest of that class. But I tried. I didn't do very well. I don't even know what I said to them. I have no idea, OK? And finally, I had to give that up and go home and gather my family together and drive to New Jersey where my mother had just been given that information. Now, you see there that people drop away from that attempt to deny after a while. Sometimes they hold on for a long time. Sometimes it drops off pretty quick. When they drop down, they go into the stage of which they're trying to recover from that. So uh, they're really struggling. That's the trial and error period. Here's the good news. Most people do recover. Most people get back to adaptive function. Some people actually improve so that they don't do those things that led up to that the next time. And some people, unfortunately, get stuck. And they may be stuck for the rest of their lives. Now, emotional reactions in a crisis is a high level of anxiety, denial, anger, remorse. Remorse is a mixed bag of sadness and uh, guilt. 
right? And from there, eventually, they move through that stage. They do grieving, and they come out on the other side of that. Now, nobody gets the reconciliation and says, yippee doo da, isn't that great? I had a tragedy. People get to reconciliation, and they say, that was really bad, but I have to go on with my life. I have to pull it together, and I have to keep on going. Because I have family, I have friends, I have stuff that I got to do. And they get there. And they may not be very happy, but they got there. If you look at the first diagram I showed you, it was going down as performance. What happens to emotions? It's going up. All right, the emotions are going out of control. This is a diagram of how the thinking and feeling looks. We are organized in our human selves to be thinking creatures with emotions supporting that. And it's not steady. It's like this, okay? And we go up and down, up and down, up and down every day. When you get a crisis, thinking shrinks, feelings explode, all right? Now, we kind of like it when we have the thinking predominating over the feeling, and when we meet people who are wired in reverse, they're annoying, all right? Uh, we, you know, we much prefer to just have them kind of be stable and normal. Well, in a crisis, what happens is that thinking shrinks, feelings explode, all right? Did my, did my feelings explode? Yeah, I have a mission. I have to continue teaching the class. Yeah, that's nice, but I'm not thinking anymore. I'm not thinking. My wife has a baby at home, and we got to package that kid and get to New Jersey. I'm not thinking that stuff. I'm thinking I got a mission to fulfill, okay? And we sometimes do crazy things. We don't think very normal when we're going through that stuff. Now, grief is one of the side effects of all of this stuff, and mourning is associated with loss, and that's expected and it's normal, and it's not fast. It's certainly expected, certainly normal, when it's associated with extreme guilt, then grief may be problematic. What you may end up with is uh, you know, psych uh, psychological uh, grief that you're stuck with for a long time, okay? Um, and then if it lasts extremely long, it's not a really good thing either. And I know of a family in my neighborhood where they lost a child to death, and uh, 17 years after that loss, that room is preserved exactly as it was on the child's day of death. And if the intensity impairs your ability to function, then you're gonna need some help with that. And that's where we start thinking referral for those folks, right? Uh, now, the emotional distress is anxiety and irritability and anger and panic, which is often associated with self-medication. Uh, sometimes people go through a vegetative depression uh, that's not a pleasant state. They're really, really down, okay? Fear, phobia, phobic avoidance, post-traumatic stress, and grief response. Daily typical stuff and the emotional levels. Uh, vegetative depression is a decreased mood, decreased appetite, decreased energy, uh, decreased sleep, decreased libido, that means sex drive. Listen, an amoeba has more drive during that period of time than human beings might, okay? Um, Predicts post-traumatic stress disorder if it's peri-traumatic, meaning surrounding the trauma. Around the trauma, uh, then it's a predictor for PTSD. It's associated with self-medication, uh, another aspect of that. Post-traumatic stress is a normal survival response. It's also known as critical incident stress. And uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is a pathogenic version of what starts off as the normal. When you see the D hint, it's for disorder, and disorder is not normal, okay? Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder results from a violation of expectations, and it's a violation of deeply held worldviews. What are some of those deeply held worldviews that get shaken up? A belief in a just and fair world. You know, life is fair. Um, you might want to question that after you go through a big disaster. A need to trust others. And if you put trust in your leadership and they fail you, if you put trust in your friends and they fail you, if you put trust in your family and they fail you, then that trust starts to disintegrate. Self-esteem, self-efficacy, that gets shattered. And that, that's what happens to emergency personnel when they go in with a mission to save lives. 
stomp out disease, eliminate pestilence. They go in with all those high thoughts and they have mission failure. And mission failure is a devastating experience for emergency personnel. Because they are built to think, we can do this, I can handle this, and it doesn't work. And they don't know where to turn when their world starts to unravel like that. And that's why we have peer support personnel, because peer support personnel make a gigantic difference. Without those peers, those people will not turn to mental health professional, and they will be stuck with nothing. Right? Now, the need for a predictable and a safe world is one of those world views. And then spirituality, belief in an order and congruence in life in the universe. And when those things get shattered, it leaves people struggling to figure their way through life. The cognitive distress, it's the thinking stuff. Sensory distortion. I worked, um, I've worked 58 disasters now, and every time I do one, there's a whole new learning experience that goes through with them. We had um, the Air Florida Flight 90 incident in Washington, D.C. And uh, there was over 300 emergency workers on the scene. There was something in the order of about 200 pieces of equipment, engines running, they had hearse tools cutting and chopping up the material so they can get the people out of the cars. The plane hit and, and hit it on a bridge, so all the cars on the bridge, people were trapped in there. It was a very, very noisy scene. When I studied it later, 60% of emergency personnel thought it was the quietest scene they had ever been on in their lives. How is that possible? With all of that activity, all of that noise. It's possible because what happens is we distort it. It's so overwhelming, we filter out everything except the most vital aspects for survival. We also have mental confusion and we dumb things down. We have an inability to concentrate, difficulty in decision making, increasing level of guilt, preoccupation with the event, inability to understand the consequences of our behavior, suicidal homicidal ideation. It's in red. That's bad. Okay? The ones in red, they're most severe symptoms you got. And then you're going to have some people deteriorate into active psychosis as a result of the experience that they've been through. Behavioral distress, impulsiveness, risk-taking, excessive eating. They go on a seafood diet, they see food, they eat. Okay? They don't need to eat, but they eat because it's there. We have alcohol and drug use, hyper-startle response, compensatory sexuality. Compensatory sexuality is this. It's when people have sexual contact with other folks that they would never have done that with if they weren't under extreme stress. Uh, you also have um, compensatory buying, where, hey, I got to go shopping, okay? Because that'll make me feel better. We have compulsivity, sleep disturbance, withdrawal, family discord, crying spells, hypervigilance, the thousand yard stare, a thousand mile stare, violence and antisocial behavior. If it's in red, it's really bad. And then we have physical distress, tachycardia, rapid heartbeat. Radicardia, going slow, sudden, extreme headaches, not a norm, hyperventilation, muscle spasm, psychogenic sweating, and uh, physical has uh, several extra slides, fatigue, exhaustion, indigestion, nausea, vomiting, blood in the stool, sputum, vomit, and urine. Listen, blood in any place it ain't supposed to be is not a good thing, okay? Chest pain and loss of consciousness. And then you have spiritual distress, anger at God, withdrawal from a faith-based community. Worse, cessation of faith-based or faith-related practices altogether. Worse than that, religious hallucinations. Very serious stuff. Now, let's look at coming out of this, because I've just spent most of my time depressing you. So now I try to pick you up a little bit, okay? Okay, here's the good, de the good news here. We all have natural resilience in our systems. It's not all equal, but we all have it. We all have the ability to conquer and overcome our distress, if we want to. Resilience can be enhanced, it can be learned, it can, people can train in it, we can practice resilience, we can strengthen what we have. Much of our resilience is based upon healthy living. 
It's how we live our lives. If we live healthily, we build resistance. Resistance is, for lack of better terms, something that builds uh, some degree of immunity to stress. And we do that best by education, and training, and practice, and building those skills and living well, okay? Okay, now, there we go. What is resiliency? Resiliency is the capacity to withstand duress. Resiliency is the capability to deal with challenges. Resiliency is the ability to bounce back from distress. Resilience is the power of a human being to overcome adversity. And there are three parts to resiliency. Resistance is the first part. Resiliency, resistance builds the immunity. Resiliency is the bouncing back. When you get knocked over, you get up. I took my daughter to skiing. My oldest daughter says, what if I fall? Get up. She said, what if I get hurt? Get up and rub it, and it'll stop hurting, okay? Resiliency. You're not gonna lay on a slope all evening. You're gonna get up. You're gonna get better. Resistance, resilience, recovery. The three R's. Resistance is the buildup of protective factors to make the person somewhat stress resistant. Resilience is the ability to manage challenges, rebound after disruptive experiences, and get above it all. Rise up in the face of adversity. Recovery, repair, resolution, restoration, and rebuilding. Amazing how many R words get attached to that, okay? It's the rebuilding after sustaining damage by overwhelming stress. It's the thing that makes rescue crews keep working in the face of overwhelming odds. Recovery, if you talk in recovery, damage has been done. Usually pretty significant damage. What do you do with recovery? Retake control of our lives. We do not let the life be controlled by things around us. Recovery is healing. It's healing physically and psychologically. Recovery is coming to terms with loss, coming to terms with pain. Recovery is putting a traumatic event into perspective and moving forward. It's not ignoring it. It's not making believe it didn't happen. It's not denial. It's the recognition that despite what we've been through, we have the power to overcome and move forward. Recovery is coming back as much as possible to the person you were before distress took over your life and is finding new ways to grow as a person. If we stop growing, we wither. Now, this little chart explains that where's resistance come from? Education, training, positive mental attitude, preparation, practice, planning, healthy living, physical fitness, nutrition, avoiding harmful substances, and getting enough rest and sleep. That'll help to build up your resistance. Will it be perfect? No. It'll be perfect, but you know, we'll do a little bit better than having nothing. Resilience, crisis intervention helps us most with that. Psychological first aid, critical incident stress management, which is a comprehensive, integrated, systematic, and multi-component approach to dealing with crisis. Support services, by the way, CISM is neither psychotherapy, nor is it a substitute for psychotherapy. And CISM is not a prevention against PTSD, and it was never designed to be. Would you be surprised if I told you that Pepto-Bismol does not cure stomach cancer? No, because Pepto-Bismol was never designed to cure stomach cancer, okay? So I'm gonna tell you, CISM, is not designed to cure PTSD, and it's not designed to prevent it. You know what it's designed for? It's designed to enhance unit cohesion and to restore people to unit performance. That's one of the things it does, okay? Um, we wanna have good support services, guidance, people need direction, information, assessment, and when you start finding that they're not getting better, they have a need to be referred, and we have to make sure those mechanisms are in place. Crisis intervention cannot do it all, 
And when we've made four or five contacts and they're not getting better, we start thinking referral. Recovery is professional care, psychotherapy, medical treatment, recovery programs. We have a program in the United States called the On-Site Academy. And they take people in there who have had some of the worst traumatic events in uh, their experience, and this happens to be fire rescue and police personnel and military personnel. And the, uh, the Onsite Academy takes some people who have been out of work due to stress reactions for four and a half months, four and a half years, and they've had a 92% return to work. That's pretty phenomenal. Referrals and other interventions as required. So if you look at that slide, it tells you that there's a lot of stuff that has to go on to help people go through uh, all these events and find their resilience. If resilience is absent, there is a greater chance of post-traumatic stress disorder. Emotions are less controlled, anger, anxiety, frustration, fear, interference with our lives. Relationships will deteriorate. Yeah, that's a big side effect of having low resilience, okay? what happens is it starts impacting your family because you can't stop it. You can't draw that barrier that keeps your stuff from happening to them. People become depressed, withdrawn, they suffer increased risk of suicide. There can be mental and physical deterioration. Job performance deteriorates, premature returns. You know, there's an interesting study done here by Western Management Consultants here in Edmonton, Alberta. And they looked at nurses in the upper regions of Canada. And they compared nurses who had um, no critical incident stress management program, and they compared them to nurses who had a very well-run uh, critical incident stress management program. It cost them $444,000 to put the program in from Canadian funds. I wish I had that. Okay? They put the program in. Then they studied it. You know what they found? 700% savings on the investment. 700% savings on the investment. For every Canadian dollar spent, $7.09 were saved. Where was it saved? It lowered disability claims against the employer. It lowered premature retirements. And it lowered unnecessary use, utilization of sick time. For every Canadian dollar spent, $7.09 came back, okay? We need to do something to help put people back on the tracks, get them back to work, back to life. Critical incident stress management is not about promoting disability and disruption. It's all about getting people back on track. That's what it's about. Now, I've developed a course for an ambulance company recently on resilience. And I was thinking about it one day, and I happened to be in the field of search and rescue, so I thought, you know what? We're trying to give them a compass. We're trying to put them back on track again. So I thought about that for a while, and I thought, okay, let's do these compass points, okay? So, I came up with this, and the first thing is, are you concerned that you don't have enough resistance? Do you have a concern that you might not be resilient enough? Okay, select the points on the eight, eight point compass. This should help you with that. Warning signs that your resilience is pretty low. In other words, change the oil, folks. What's the warning signs? Growing feelings of boredom with life and work. Other warning signs. Persistent fatigue despite having adequate sleep. I'm not sure what exactly what adequate sleep means because I don't get it, but uh, you know, I think we need to have better sleep. Inten uh, intensifying anxiety, both general and specific. Pervasive worry. Feeling lost and certain and depressed. Increasing anger and ir irritability. You know, anger is the feeling, irritability is showing everybody the feeling. <laughs> Withdrawal from contact with family, friends, and colleagues. Pretty significant, okay? That tells you you're in trouble, you're a mess. Fix this before it gets worse. Compass point two, if you wanna get back on track, learn to calm your system, okay? 
There's some interesting quotes here. Marcus Tullius uh, uh, Cicero says, the pursuit even of the best things ought to be calm and tranquil. So what about calming? Calming, first, breathe, okay? We often stop breathing when we're under distress and it actually works against us. You know, I had bilateral foot surgery uh, four years ago. And the day I had to go in to get have those pins removed, was, it was just not a good day at all. Um, I was worried about the, pulling these pins out. I get onto that table. This doctor pulls out a pliers out of the drawer, and I got that pliers in my garage. And it was very disconcerting. Now, he's going to use what I got in my garage to pull these pins out of my toes, and he starts working them out. It's like taking a nail out of a two-by-four is kind of what it reminds me of, right? And it hurts. And he says to me, the secret to pain control is breathing. And I go, I am breathing, I am breathing, I am breathing. Yeah, I couldn't breathe because I was so worked up with the anxiety of this thing, all right? And then he taps me with his elbow and he says, listen, I got a lady next door. She's a lot more anxious than you. You gotta suck this one up and don't show that fear because I don't want her to be scared. I was completely amazed that he said that. So, you know, all right, give me the silver bullet. I'll try to bite that and see if that helps. <laughs> Calm the heart, okay, and the body first. The brain will follow that. Calm the heart, the body first. Brain will follow. Breathe, hold for a few seconds, release. It sounds so simple, and yet we have trouble pulling off these simple things. Tense and release um, already tight muscle groups. Once the body calms, the brain can quiet down. Then thinking gets easier and clearer. Focus your thinking on solutions. Engage in rational thought. There's a new concept. Engage in rational thought. Instead of just wild and woolly thoughts, I guess, okay? Um, check your options. What appears to be the best options available? That's where you want to go. Compass point three. Optimism. Winston Churchill is quoted up there, pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, and an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So let's look at the optimism. Change your view of the world. Problems are temporary and can be overcome. You know, 2,000 years ago, Epictetus said, it is not things that upset us, it is the way we perceive those things. And if we start following that philosophy, and we start looking at things in a more optimistic view, we're not going to be distressed so much. Know the difference between controllable factors and uncontrollable factors. And put your energy on the things you have the power to control, and stop trying to control the things you can't control. Optimism feeds self-esteem where you can now say with comfort, I am capable and self-efficacy, I can influence others and be an agent of change. Self-efficacy guides the actions we take, the intensity of our effort and the duration of our work. Right? It's very important that we have the optimism. Optimis optimism, it does not predict the future, it creates the future, we take control of it. We take the word impossible and we and erase the I am and it makes it possible. If problems can't be solved, we can find a way to just go around them. All right? We had a truck stuck under one of our bridges. It went on fire, it's burning the bridge, and they're convinced this thing is gonna do a lot of damage. And they're trying to figure out how to tow it back out from under the bridge while it's still burning and some kid says, puncture the tires. <laughs> because it'll make the truck go flatter than you tow it back. And you know, that worked. Simple stuff. Try to obtain guidance and support from a more experienced person. Buddy systems, share to work. Try something and allow for an imperfect performance. Try something. Maybe it won't work, but give it a whirl, folks. Don't sit there saying, there's nothing we can do. Really? Nothing? Do something. Try it. Try to absorb the optimism from others. 
Oops. Optimism is related to happiness. Happiness is directly linked to optimism. Happiness is the opposite of being stressed. Are you happy or stressed? Right? Happy people tend to make others around them feel happy. Smile. Say positive things to people. Say positive things about other people behind their back. That's a concept. <laughs> Be friendly and a friend. Happiness is associated with genuine emotions and the sense of one's life and oneself are good and meaningful and worthwhile. Okay? I had to go to Miami one time and I had to defend critical incident stress management field. And when I went down there, I met a group of people who just were misinterpreting the data. They got it all wrong. And I found them to be uneducable. Okay? They had what their attitude was is, don't confuse me with facts. I have already made up my mind, okay? And it was a very discouraging day. And I got back on board an airplane to fly out of Miami. And I fell asleep somewhere around takeoff. When I wake up, there's a flight attendant leaning over me, and she's looking at my chest. That's kind of startling. It's they're like, you know, inches off your face. And I looked up at her and I'm thinking, should I check my pulse? You know, am I still with it? And she said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to wake you up. I was just reading your shirt and I had International Critical Incident Stress Foundation on my shirt. And um, she says, you know, my airline has a team that has a very similar name. And I said, really? And she said, I had to use them twice in two weeks. I said, really? What happened? And she said, on the first one, she said, this poor man came on the airplane. He wasn't looking good when he came on. Ends up after we get at altitude, he has cardiac arrest. She said, I'm trying to do CPR. I have never done CPR in my life before. I'm trying to do CPR. There's nobody who's medically trained on the plane. And we called an emergency landing, and the pilot puts it down at the closest airport. And she said, unfortunately, the poor man died. It was very upsetting. And she said, and what happened is they came along and um, told us that they were going to replace our crew, that is the flight attendant crew. The pilots were okay because they were up front, they didn't see it. If I don't see it, it ain't happening. All right. Um, <laughs> so they cleared the flight attendant crew off. She is the worst. The others are a little upset, but she's new, she's young, she's very distressed by this. And they take her into a room, they sit down, they talk with her, they let her tell the story, okay? And they introduce themselves, hey, we're members of the critical incident response team for the airline, and uh, they talk to her. And she says, you know, they were really nice, and they took me out to dinner, and they made sure I was okay, and they all gave me their phone numbers in case I had to call somebody in the middle of the night, and they were just so wonderful, it was really great, okay? And she says, and I said, well, what about the second event? What happened with that? She says, I get on a plane, she says, same route, Two weeks, you know, it's the second week, same exact route. We're flying the same uh, working crew. And she says, we take off. There's a woman who's got a baby. And she says, you know, in the front of the airplane, the flight attendants face back, so they're watching what's going on. She said, this baby begins to choke. And the baby's turning blue. She said, I jumped out of my seat. I grabbed that baby. I sat down and I, I did the Heimlich maneuver and I got something out of the baby's mouth and the baby started to breathe. And she said, and I am not giving this baby up to nobody, including the mommy, because the mommy just sat there. So she said, I held that baby and I watched that baby all the way. And she said, and we did an emergency landing in the same city. And then all of a sudden, the same people come on board. Hey, here you are again. What happened? OK? I thought we fixed you before. So what happens with that is she said, so what do you do? And I said, I trained your team. And she says, well, sir, then you have touched my heart, and I thank you for it. Okay, and that deep southern drawl, and you kind of melt. You know what? After that, I'm good for 10 more years. <laughs> because that was something that uplifted me, that something made a difference in her life. All right? Um, folks are usually about as happy as to make their minds up to be, says Abraham Lincoln. Okay? Uh, manage stress, very important issue here. Um, Regular physical exercise, most stress diseases are related to a lack of physical ex uh, exercise. 
Physical exercise improves cardiovascular function, brain perfusion, et cetera. Manage medical conditions, prevent them from getting worse. These are the medical conditions you want to pay attention to. If these are going on in your life, you really need some medical care for these things because they're only going to keep deteriorating you and causing you more and more and more difficulties as time goes on. Manage stress. It'll give you a resilient brain. Use your nutrition to help you do that. You know, eat foods that are good antioxidants because they kill off some of the free radicals that are trying to kill you off. Keep hydrated, drink plenty of water. Be very careful with uh, sports drinks. A lot of sugar in them, okay? Uh, they also contain a great deal of caffeine and other stimulants. Uh, do not use nicotine products in any form if you want to be reducing your stress. Now, if you really want stress, smoke a lot. All right, and use a lot of caffeinated products. Reduce sugar intake, avoid the white bread. Uh, let me move ahead here. Sleep is very important. Most adults should get seven to eight hours sleep. Most adults in the United States get about six hours sleep. So we're already running on low. Um, if you are working a 17 hour shift, it's equivalent to working with a blood alcohol level of 0.05. Okay? If you're working 24 hours, it's as if you had a 0.1 blood alcohol level. It doesn't make you drunk. What it says is it's equivalent to working as if you were drunk. Compass 0.5, abuse no, uh, abuse no one and nothing, for abuse turns to wise ones to fools and robs the spirit of its vision. That's from Tecumseh, famous American warrior, uh, Indian warrior. Make sure you have a life outside the job. Under duress, here's what you can expect. Relationships will change. Sometimes those changes are permanent. And it's not easy to take if you really care about somebody. Vivid old trauma memories come back. Being stressed does not imply weakness or is a sign of mental disturbance. Resilient survivors have moral strength. Moral strength encompasses the practice of honesty, responsibility, trustworthiness, fairness, etc. Compass point six. Success means to be connected with action. Um, stressful people keep moving. They make mistakes, but they don't quit. And it must work for this dude, because that's Conrad Hilton. And he got to be a success because he didn't stop. Action, take action, do something, focus on problem solving, be prepared to take some risk. Be flexible, don't give up, keep trying. Change to a new action plan if what you're doing isn't working. Okay? Um, you got to have a can-do attitude, uh, take uh, reasonable actions, listen, breathe, calm yourself, assess, analyze, problem solve, decide, take action. You might make a mistake. It's better than doing nothing. As we say, give it a whirl. Try it out. Compass point number seven, social support and involvement. You know, Shakespeare's famous quote in uh, Henry V, from this day to the ending of the world, we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, seek social support. It helps you to get through the crisis. Social network is essential for positive mental health. Find positive supportive people. Some family members may be great support, some are not. You gotta choose wisely, okay? Just because they wear the same last name doesn't mean, and they might be from the same gene pool, but it doesn't mean they're gonna be supportive. We have six types of people we deal with. Family members is one, friends is another, acquaintances is another, enemies is another, frenemies, which are people who act like friends, but they're really enemies, okay? And then everybody else in the world. We need social support, so you gotta choose wisely. Praise your friends publicly, but express criticism privately if that seems to be necessary. Number eight on the compass point, the man who does not value himself cannot value anything or anyone. Self-esteem is a realistic appraisal of yourself. Self-esteem is enhanced by self-awareness. Self-esteem encourages us to grow and to learn. Self-esteem enables us to help others. And I hope that all of you and myself can work together and grow old in this work together.
that is an old Jewish prayer, and it basically says, we are in it together, let's work it together, let's make a difference and put a world. Thank you very much.